Welcome, everyone. Before we begin, let me once again thank our interpreters who enrich our experience here through their extraordinary talent. You know, I've tried to learn a bit of sign language while I'm here, and I am constantly in awe of what these people do, uh, especially the fast processing that has to occur up here. Uh, you know, imagine RIT is one of RIT's biggest days. But the evening before, actually, we, we sort of settled on a tradition of celebrating innovation here and the innovative spirit that we're in the process of engendering here on our campus. And for five years, we have inducted a wide range of innovators with strong ties to RIT, and many of whom, like Chester Carlson and George Eastman, uh, had a relationship with RIT sort of earlier, maybe even back to the time of our inception. And history may show, however, that tonight's honoree, Alex Kipman, he may outshine them all. I just simply cannot imagine his, what his career will look like when, the, when he's done, because he's still at very early stages of his career. Much like Alex, of course, RIT has innovation at our core, uh, maybe, maybe in some way because most of our top academic programs are actually in non-traditional disciplines. And the level of, cross, of collaboration across disciplines is, uh, is, is quite strong here. And our unique focus on the deaf and hard of hearing, and that's internationally recognized, and I think adds a kind of diversity to our community that you just won't find anyplace else. And our innovative nature is just one of the things that puts RIT in the category of the world's great universities. Not so much because we seek to replicate the great universities of the 20th century, but because we're so different, and in many cases already practicing what other universities are moving to provide in the future. Our focus on STEM, integrated with the arts, fine arts, design, business, social sciences, and the humanities, is fundamental to the innovative engine that we've become here. But in the end, it's always our students who take our IT to innovative heights, and some of those heights we administrators can only imagine. Alex was this type of student, and our clear choice for the RIT Innovation Hall of Fame. And to help you understand the process by which he was chosen for this award, I want to introduce Richard DiBartino, our Simone Endowed Chair Holder for Innovation and Entrepreneurship at RIT, and the director of the Simone Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship, who will explain the process. Richard? Thank you and welcome everyone. Let me briefly explain the process of inducting individuals into the Innovation Hall of Fame and then recognize individuals that sat on the committee and the, the people that did the real work. Um, first of all, when we actually in induct people into the Innovation Hall of Fame, it's a big process issue because we reach out to all 114,000 RIT alums and we send them email messages asking them to nominate and we make phone calls. So when you get mad at RIT for sending too many emails, well, we're one of the, the people that you should be blaming. But we also go to the faculty, we also go to employers, we go to the entire RIT community. And when we do this, we typically will get one or 200 names, some formal nominations, some non-formal nominations, but it's a lot of information. Um, those go to two committees. The first is a committee that weeds through them and, and generally comes up with a dozen or so. Sometimes it's two dozen, sometimes it's one, but we try to bring it down. And then there's a selection committee and they determine who goes in. So this year, again, we had over 100 that we reviewed. It went to the committee and as we went through it, and it went to the selection committee, they kept on talking about the individuals and the same name came up first and then many other names and there were great individuals that were considered, but um, Alex was the one that was so pronounced, we decided we're only gonna select one and this year we we're gonna bring Alex in and we were very pleased, the, the committee was very pleased with the selection. Let me go through some of the names um, that were involved in this. The nomination committee um, included Scott Atkins, Enid Cardinal, Robin Cass, Frank Cost, Dick Doolittle, um, Kelly Redder, Sandra Rothenberg, Andreas Sikalakis, 
and Becky Simmons, and all of those came from different academic fields and, and with different experiences so that we could give everyone their, their due. The selection committee included many former inductees into the Innovation Hall of Fame, and that included Andrew Brenneman, Barry Colhane, Jim DeCaro, Bob Fabio, Hector Flores, Emerson Fullwood, John Hamilton, Dean Kamen, Patricia Moore, Jackie Pankari, Ken Reed, John Rasig, Andrew Sears, and Brian Shanahan. And so um, the last group of individuals I'd like to recognize for their work are Christine Corrado and Janet Frank, who in fact are from Alumni Affairs and quite, to be honest with you, they did almost all the work. They brought all the information in, they sent all the emails, and they need to be recognized. But um, now to introduce the uh, the film that we're going to show the short and, uh, and to talk a little bit about our inductee. We're going to have uh, our provost. Um, we're going to have our provost um, come in and give the talk. Thank you, Richard. A couple of weeks ago, my wife and I found uh, ourselves in uh, that American curious innovation called the shopping mall. And we left a store and I noticed that there was a young girl in kind of the courtyard of the mall there gyrating and dancing in front of a sofa where there were some adults and presumably they were her parents. And as we walked past the, the group there, I noticed that the adults weren't really looking at the young girl dancing and gyrating. They were looking at the video screen there where there was an avatar beautifully syncopated to the girl's movements. Well, of course, it was an Xbox One and the Kinect system was working perfectly. And I turned to my wife and I said, <clears throat> that's RIT right there. Well, if you think about how many Xbox Ones and Xbox 360s with the Kinect system have been sold in the United States, and I did a little Google search, so it's totally unscientific. I estimate there's at, at least 35 million units have been sold. 35 million units. There are 111,000 households in the United States. Now, not all of those units sold went into an American household, but, but even if 15 million of those units were sold and went into American households, think about the impact that an RIT graduate has had with that single invention. It's absolutely astounding that the impact is there, and I think you can all appreciate why Alex was chosen for this year's Innovator of the Year Award from RIT. But <clears throat> the impact is felt not just in those numbers, by, but by the people he has influenced and people he has impacted. And there's no better way to capture that impact than in a, one of our wonderfully produced videos. So let's enjoy that video now. I'd like to present Mr. Galozano with something very special. This is our first sweatshirt bearing the name <laughs> of our granny college. We created the software engineering program in the mid-90s, and Alex was in the first class of 15 brave souls who decided to switch out of another computing program into this new thing called software engineering. Obviously, Alex was one of the smartest students in his class. There's no doubt about that. But it was something else, something intangible about him. His personality, his drive, his breadth of interest that really made him stand out in the crowd. I knew he was going to go far. I didn't know where he was going to go far, but I saw from the very beginning that he was going to be an outstanding graduate and representative of our program. 
I think a thing that really makes Alex stand out is his ability to see things that don't exist yet, to look at existing technologies and envision ways that you can really push them forward and do new things and combine them in ways that hasn't been done before. And that's what he's done, which has led to things like the Kinect and the HoloLens. I, I think the thing that's most exciting about the Kinect is the way that they were able to combine a number of different technologies to allow people to interact with computing devices without having to actually hold some physical object. And then being able to do this in the context of a relatively complicated environment, such as your living room, is, is really what made that technology special. But I think what is more exciting is that when people see these technologies, others envision new things. And they're using it to provide doctors with access to medical images in the OR. They're using it to support the physical rehab process uh, during physical therapy. I, I am confident that Alex sees these other potential applications and he's leveraging that initial application of gaming as a way of going after the technology and developing it and getting it mature, knowing that once it's there, the, the, there are no limits to what it can be used for. Autism spectrum disorder is a neurodevelopmental disorder in which young people have impairments in social communication and cognitive and behavioral flexibility. They struggle with both of those things. So it's very hard for young people with autism to turn that inside out. The value of the Connect platform and this type of representational technology is that it allows us to create a flexible, customizable, therapeutic, reflective surface. Technology like this becomes this wonderful way for helping people see their insides, see their emotions, see their movement, reflect on them and change them. That's what happens whenever you're in front of a mirror. We can put much more in this mirror. Having the kids learn a way to connect and to explain how they're feeling, to be able to show that is very important. So this can give them a sense of effectiveness and allow them to come out of their shell a bit. And parents begin to say, I haven't seen him do this before. I haven't seen her come out of the script so much before. I haven't seen that person be this creative before. That's pretty exciting. Technology in medicine has risen at an extreme rate, and it's really launched us into the appropriate century where medicine had been lagging behind other industries. So in the past, you have a digital screen on the wall that's static, that the physician is relying on someone else to, say, manipulate an artery or make it larger. With this technology, they don't have to take the gloves off, break their sterile field, they can actually manipulate the image and using motions to change the contrast, using motions to make it three-dimensional on a two-dimensional screen. I was thinking, as an emergency medicine physician, what this would do in a trauma case, to be able to quickly speak to a surgeon and say, hey, listen, we're in the trauma. I know the patient is bleeding from the abdomen. I just got the CAT scan. I can see the blood, but I was able to manipulate the image, wipe out the rest, and I can see the laceration on the spleen. And not only can I see it, I can see its depth. That is life-saving. I'm incredibly excited to introduce to you Microsoft HoloLens. Holographic computing is here. When I was first shown the example of the HoloLens, the ability to wear a device that allowed me to interact with my environment, that allowed me to truly have three dimensions in my visual field as a physician, just was mind-blowing. If you can imagine, here's the fracture of the radius. Let me make that bigger for you. Now you see it right there? Excellent. You know what? I'm going to turn this so you can see how, how that fracture went into that growth plate and what we're going to need to do about it. That technology would, would advance medicine at a pace faster than any technology that I've seen. We live in a day and age which is unprecedented in history in that the technological revolution has given us the ability to close the gap between our ability to dream and our power to do. Alex's technology is so 
uh, spectacularly applicable to what we do as designers. Designers are adapters by nature. Um, new technologies become part of the water we drink. I think that one of the, the biggest challenges behaving in design space is to communicate with others what your intentions are. And there's plenty of room for miscommunication in two-dimensional space. As you begin to move into three-dimensional space, those ideas um, are much easier to grasp. And so I think that this visualization technique will become rapidly included in the language of design and um, I think it will aid in the process in, in a seamless way. Designers are always dreaming about next steps and I think this fits neatly into the trajectory of what uh, designers need to do to move ideas forward. We always have the, but what if it could do this question in our mind? And we always think that technology isn't there. The ability to unleash the what-if ideas that sit in the back of your mind, to me, that's innovation. To me, innovation is about the paradigm shift, shifting the frame in which it's done. Everybody knows that kids with autism relate to technology better than people. Why don't we let those two come together? Uh, sometimes it is as simple as being able to take existing technologies and apply them in new ways. And sometimes it is just coming up with an idea that is kind of crazy and out of the box that, that nobody's really thought about before. Seeing the technology where it sits, seeing where it's going, and being able to grab on that by the handle and, uh, and pull, make the future, if you will, as the technology is changing under your feet. This is just one of the most gratifying things I can think of, that a student that at one time I had the privilege and the honor to teach has succeeded so well, so quickly in his career. I can only wait to see what happens in the next few years. We are not only so pleased to include Alex Kipman into the RIT Innovation Hall of Fame, but we could not be prouder that he is an alumnus of this university. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct honor to ask Alex to come on up here and to introduce you to him as the 2015 RIT Innovation Hall of Fame inductee, Alex Kipman. Alex, I think they want to get a picture of this. So. Okay. Would you like to say a few words? For sure. Thank you. Am I on? <laughs> yeah, you're probably on. Hello. Hello. I'll go here. Wow. It's surreal being here today. Uh, 14 years ago, I was a student sitting in class here at RIT getting ready for my commencement speech, um, not commencement speech, uh, getting ready to go to my commencement ceremony. And, uh, you know, I'm pretty sure I was sitting in class dreaming about the infinite probabilities of what the future um, could have. And um, I have to tell you that not in my wildest dream would I think that 14 years later I'd be here um, receiving this award. Um, it's just spectacular. Um, at the end of the day, you know, man, sitting here 14 years ago as a student, infinite probabilities um, of what that future could, could have become. And in the process of measuring each one of those moments in time, from moment of time to moment of, of time, deliberately measuring and making choices, and choices in life matter, um, here we are. All other probabilities at any point in time get destroyed, and you end up choosing and making um, your own present. I was just coming from San Francisco this morning where we unveiled the next chapter of HoloLens, the developer side of it in our biggest developer conference um, build. 
And I sat there in the airplane um, flying on the red eye from last night to here thinking about innovation and um, receiving this award and came to the conclusion that we are super lucky, all of us, to live in this moment in time, to live in this moment in time and live in this art form that um, we love um, so much. Computers have existed for less than 100 years, um, which means that it's easier for me to win this award today. It'll be much harder to win an innovation award in the year 5,555 um, in technology. So by being such a nascent industry, such a nascent um, art form, um, you know, I thought to myself, you know, temporally adjusted, um, we are but cave people. And we just kind of sort of discovered charcoal and we drew the first stick figure of a human on a cave. Now most of us argue all day long about what to do next. Do we draw, you know, with the green charcoal? Do we draw the sun or the gazelle in the cave? Or in reality, real perspective we should have is how do we go from, you know, stick figure in the cave to the Sistine Chapel of our industry? Now, none of us should be arrogant enough to think we are going to see the Sistine Chapel of our industry in our lifetimes. Turns out that, you know, pattern matched art form from art form industry to industry, they all move at the same clip and you'll literally take us thousands of years to get to the Sistine Chapel of our industry. But I'll be damned if we don't at least postulate what taking a step outside of the cave looks like. And to some extent, you know, 14 years ago, I was sitting here in class daydreaming about infinite probabilities in the future. It took me probably seven years in my career at Microsoft to kind of reason against what my point of view was in terms of postulation of the, what taking a step outside of the cave looked like. And it's this gentleman, computer scientist, famous computer scientist, Alan Kay, that used to say, best way to predict the future is to invent it. I love the guy. I love most of his quotes. In this particular one, I disagree with him. I actually think best way to predict the future is to understand the past, which again makes us incredibly lucky because we don't have that much in history to go back in time to be able to fully understand every choice and every step in time of what has happened in our industry. Computers are born, 1940s, digital universe is born. It has a big bang that is very analogous to our analog big bang. Four bits and you're off to the races to calculate really fast atomic chain reactions to kill a lot of people. And it's expanding, much like our universe. Today, our digital universe probably expands at petabytes a second. And yet, and it has created the world that exists today. It's a beautiful thing. But words matter. Symbology matters. We created a digital universe. What does that mean? That means it's a, a universe of finality. Um, it's a world of zero or one, true or false, black or white, yes or no, on or off. And that's fantastic, because as developers, we can essentially create a beautiful universe that fits in our heads, a universe that essentially devolves into causality. We dream um, all the different causes, and we program the different effects. Many of us go to school to try to understand the art of elegant design, the least amount of causes that generate the most intuitive set of effects. And it's a beautiful thing. Um, but it turns out that, you know, what is the value of technology to humankind? Why is it that we have fallen in love with technology and the world around us is filled with it today? And I can kind of abstract it to a very simple two things. Technology allows us humans, and I don't care in what field, communication, productivity, entertainment. It allows us to do two things, two superpowers that we do not have as humans. It allows us to display space, and it allows us to display time. I can now communicate with someone in Mars, um, even though I'm not there with them. Um, that's displacing space. Um, I can also communicate to someone in the future and in the past. That's displacing time. The con, however, the benefit is huge. Clearly easy to articulate why we love technology. It gives us superpowers. It allows us to display space and time. The con, on the other hand, is also not that great. Think about life today. You wake up in the morning, you're stuck behind your phones, tablets, or PCs. 
You go into work, you spend the majority of your adult life behind some monitor of some sort, typing your life away. And you come home and your idea of being entertained more often than not is losing yourself behind digital pixels. Now, the benefit is so high that we do it. But what if? And this is where I postulate taking a step of the outside of the cave starts looking like. What does the world look like if you can have all the benefit, displacement of space and time, without all of the con, being sucked into a confined, finite universe that is digital? So from that perspective, then you say, okay, so if you're rejecting the digital, what are you accepting? And you say you accept the analog. So let's contrast the two universes. Analog is the universe you and I live in. It's not by any means or stretch of the imagination finite, it's infinite. Um, it's not causality based, it's free will based. We don't reason in our universe in terms of zero or one, we reason in terms of zero and one both at the same time. We don't reason in terms of black or white, we reason in terms of infinite shades of gray. We don't reason in terms of yes or no, it's all probabilities. And we don't reason in terms of true or falses, we reason in terms of maybes. Now that freaks you out as a developer. Go try to write infinity worth of if-then-elses. It takes a long time. But it is the state of technology, and it is what it means to take a step outside of the cave. Now I'm an engineer. Um, so we leave you know, vision without execution. It's called hallucination. Um, so you then say, fine, understand the vision. Visions are easy. How do you actually translate that into you know, your life's work? And the way to think about it is to devolve the problem in terms of understanding the analog universe from perspective of machine. And I can say perspective of machine looking out, our universe devolves into three things. You're either a human, you're an environment, or you're an object. And the rule set is pretty straightforward also. A human must exist within an environment. We have no other choice. And we can really do only one of three things. We can interact with another human, we can interact with an object, or we can interact with an environment. Now I said the word interaction. Symbology matters, we should define the term. Perspective of a machine looking out, you know, interaction of the real universe comes in three fashions. You either have some input modality, some output modality, or some haptic feedback. Now you're getting excited, at least I'm getting excited, because you can put um, all of it in a three by three table. And as an engineer, if you can create a three by three table, everything becomes easy. You can put humans, environments, and objects on one axis, and you can put input, output, and haptic feedback on the other axes. Now, I wish I could tell you that seven years ago, the table was described in this sordid fashion. Like anything in life, creation is dirty. It's a very dirty process. Um, you need to fail, and fail a lot before you get anywhere. Today, I gave you the story in a sordid fashion. I'm seven years into this discovery. Um, but the way that I laid out the table, there's another beautiful thing that happens, like most things in the universe. These things all follow laws by ten, of 10. If I were to say that the difficulty of understanding humans is x, the difficulty of understanding environments is 10x. The, the difficulty of understanding objects is 100x. Equally, if we say that understanding input is y, understanding output is 10y, and understanding haptic feedback is 100y. Just think about what it takes to have sensors around in the universe. Most of you are wearing them around your wrists. Now think about, you know, that's input. Now think about output for a minute. That's putting photons on the back of your eyes safely. That's a little bit harder. Now think about haptic feedback. That's putting energy on every cell of your body. Um, that's dramatically harder. So that's exciting because it allows you to give you a roadmap for how you approach the problem. And in most things in life, you have to be stubborn. And it's good to understand where you're going if you're going to be stubborn, particularly if there's going to be a lot of failure and a lot of dirty process um, trying to get there. So then you say, great, you can start on one by one. That's the easiest thing. That's human input. And eventually, you die or you get to 100 by 100, which is full understanding of the universe from an input-output haptic feedback, humans, environments, and objects. Well, it's not hard to imagine that human input, that one by one, is that connecting you guys saw. That's all Connect is. And as a matter of fact, human input, by the way, secret for all of us friends, I never pitched Connect at Microsoft, I pitched the table. Um, we just picked Xbox as an environment where people are willing to suspend this belief um, and where the technology was most likely to get a good footing and a good place to start. 
but the original pitch was the table. That's seven years ago. Now, human input is too complicated. So you say, fine, can we go from full human understanding to coarse human understanding? And that's what Connect is at the end of the day. Connect understands humans from a coarse perspective, from the perspective of identity, he knows who you are, from a perspective of speech, Xbox on, Xbox turn off, Xbox being Harry Potter, and from the perspective of gestures, which is what you saw in the video today. Now as you devolve into time, you don't stop. Anything that you go from a coarse level understanding, you over time bring to a fine grain level of understanding. As an example, Xbox on and turn off devolve into, that's just traditional category one command and control, small vocabularies. Devolves into what Cortana has become, still coming out of the same people, the same heads. And Cortana is the speech agent that shows up on Windows 10 that we're really excited about, where I can say, hey Cortana, give me all the emails by Jim Fisher. Nope, just the ones from last week. No, just the ones filter it with attachments with photos. That's a natural language speech that's a triple turn conversation that will ship in Windows 10. That's just an example of how speech goes from coarse to fine over a span of a few years and a lot of stubborn people. Identity, and that's all we did with Xbox and Connect. We kind of sort of knew who you are, we said hello, how are you, Professor Lutz? Um, that's essentially, a, you can reason against it in terms of being about one in 50 false accepts, about a 75% true positive rate. We introduced in Windows 10, Windows hello, same people, same head, same stubborn. One in 100,000 false accepts, 95% plus true positives. That's the difference between identification and authentication. Authentication gives you access to payment instruments, credit cards, and corporate resources. And it's something that's shipping in Windows 10 from the little screens to the big screens to no screens at all. Gestures, you've all seen it, um, connect, they're coarse. 20 joints on the human body coming at about 30 frames per second. It's magical, still hasn't been replicated in the world, but you don't stop. That's coarse level understanding. Today in HoloLens, you know, I understand where your gaze is. I understand your gaze vector to about 0.04 milliradians of precision. That's 0.04 millimeters at one meter, and I know where you're looking. I understand your gestures anywhere around your body, and all you have to do is look. I understand your intent, it's likely reading your brain, and you can select. That's gestures going from coarse to fine-grained over a small span of years. That will ship the, um, in the Windows time frame with HoloLens. But that's just one cell in the table and you can see how you can lose yourself forever in the deliciousness that is human input. But that's not what we do as engineers. In 2010, when we shipped Connect, yes, we went from coarse to fine, but we did what engineers do. We shifted right and we shifted down. We started evolving into understanding human input and output, and we introduced a new actor or actress into the scene, this idea of understanding an environment. If you go from shading one cell in the table to shading four cells in the table, life gets more interesting. Matter of fact, life gets holographic. I um, mean, you get HoloLens. HoloLens is just another product in the same way that Connect was just a product in the same way that Windows Hello or Cortana are just products. None of these things, they're all points in time. Points in time don't matter. Um, it really is about the state of mind. The table is the state of mind. And the table is about postulating what it looks like taking a step outside of the cave. Um, seven years into it, um, and you know, three cells are still coarse. Our environment understanding is coarse. HoloLens can understand about a 10 by 10 by six meter cube environment. Um, how does that go from coarse to fine over time? You start connecting all of these topologies over the world. You start crowdsourcing as all the people are feeding the information at the same time. And next thing you know, people don't have to fly really expensive airplanes to map the world. The world is mapped for you by many people wearing the devices. You walk into a space and you don't have to scan it yourself. Someone didn't walk beforehand and had scanned it for you. Same thing for output. Putting energy in the back of your eyes without making you fatigue, uh, without making you have vestibular issues is really hard. You have to be super careful. Um, at the end of the day, I wish I could tell you that you can see the universe, you can't. We all hallucinate the universe. 
Um, you are but a beautiful organic machine. You have sensors as eyes, they're like cameras. Um, you have, you know, sensors in the back of your head that are like, you know, IMUs. Um, and you have your acoustic sensory information. These things go through this massive Kalman filter called your brain, and through that process, you perceive. You perceive what your brain wants you to perceive. If ever that Kalman filter disagrees with each other, these signals are not coming in as they're supposed to, what does your brain think? Your brain thinks that you somehow poisoned yourself. So what does your brain do? Darwin would tell you that you start um, yawning, more oxygen in my lungs. Then you start burping, maybe I should get the poison out. And eventually you throw up. That's where nauseousness comes from. It's your sensory inputs disagreeing with each other as you move through life. Well, as soon as I start putting photons on the back of your head, and as soon as I start putting spatial sound all around you, the ability that we have to make your sensors disagree with each other is uh, very high. Um, well, HoloLens um, does not do that. And it's a lot of the innovation we do is so you perceive a hologram with a zero fatigue across, you know, per um, spectrum of all humans, not just first person shooter humans that don't fatigue anyways, they're trained pilots. Um, but that's just course level human output. And that again will progress over time. And you can see how very quickly we will devolve in from course to fine on four cells of the table, but that won't be sufficient. We're engineers. We will again shift right and we'll again shift down and life will go on. So that, in essence, is my view of innovation. It's my point of view of where I'm putting my little zeros and ones over the next long time um, to you know, provide humans with a choice and a postulation of what taking a step out of the cave looks like. And in one happy note, um, seven years into it, 14 since I graduated, I do believe that the road of innovation ahead is significantly longer than the road of innovation behind. Um, with that, thank you. I'm deeply honored and humbled that you guys bestowed this amazing um, present on me. It means a ton to me. Um, I love coming back home. I love seeing the, you know, 14 years ago opening the Golisano uh, College. Uh, we've come a long way, all of us, um, since. I'm deeply grateful to all of you, um, and I want to thank you. Extraordinary. So we're, we're learning from you on a day-by-day -day basis. It's absolutely marvelous. I think we have time for a few questions from the audience, uh, about 10 minutes or so, before we, <clears throat> before we call it uh, quits here. So uh, if anyone is in the audience that would like to ask Alex a question, this would be a perfect time. But I have one ready to go, so while you're thinking of one, um, <clears throat> Well, first of all, if, if, you're, if you're working with charcoal, uh, what the heck am I using? Because uh, you're so far ahead of us. But <clears throat> seriously, at RIT, we have a new strategic plan. And at the heart of that strategic plan is this notion uh, that we want to graduate our students with more T-shaped kind of skills. So for your work in, in the HoloLens in particular, I know you have to build teams of individuals coming together. What kind of skills are you looking for in a team uh, that will help create these wonderful ideas and products? For sure, that's a great question and one that I spend a lot of time thinking about. Um, if you're trying to do something meaningful in life, culture matters, and it matters quite a, a, a grand deal. And um, as you said, today's world, um, you can't get everybody that's you know, like-minded. You need people from very different walks in life to do anything productive in life. Um, so then, how do you create culture when everybody comes from very different backgrounds, from very different places, with very different skill sets? My team has people that will range from you know, optics to silicon to mechanical to electrical engineering to software engineering of the system kind, low-level stuff, to run times to UX platform, to you know, developer platforms, to ultimately designers and experiences and musicians and artists um, and everywhere in between. 
Um, I have people that understand humans. I have psychologists. Um, I have ophthalmologists on my team and any number of other things. So I spend a lot of time thinking through how do you come up with a shared DNA? Because at the end of the day, you know, if you can get to the same DNA of people, it doesn't matter what their background in life is. And um, I would say the DNA that I look for in people, on my team in particular, as I interview and as we hire, is really three things. Um, and it's three things that I try to put not too much in the learnable category, although everything in life is learnable. Uh, but more in those things that, you know, I try to find it when it's more innate uh, and more pure. And the first one is um, creative people, just generally creative people. And I don't care what walk of life you come from. We work in a space and in a world where you can't look it up on Wikipedia. You can't phone a professor friend. You can't go buy a book about it. Uh, it is really new invention. Um, so at that point, you have to be creative. And there's ways to metricate creativity. There's ways to get better at creativity. There's ways um, to continue flexing um, your creative muscles, and it's important. It's the reason why I go to Burning Man every year. The next one is passion and passionate people. And passion begets this idea that um, I shared this with students today at lunch. Um, even if you work 9 to 5, Monday through Friday, it's not the case for most people in this room, I imagine. But just imagine, go with me for a minute. That's all you do in life, 9 to 5, Monday through Friday. And it's still the majority of your adult life. And you're too sophisticated of an organic thing to waste the majority of your adult life not doing something you absolutely love. Now, if all of a sudden you do something you absolutely love, it is your hobby, and they happen to pay you for it, um, then all of a sudden you're passionate about it. I ask people on my team, do you have hobbies? And if they do, I start wondering about them. Because you shouldn't have hobbies. Your work should be your hobby. Imagine how cool that is. I don't have hobbies. Well, unless you think about holograms. Holograms are my hobby. And then the life becomes different. My life transitions from a life where I have to ask people to be at work and make sacrifices, where my life is about sending people home and telling them that I've had enough of them and they need to go some, spend some time outside of the walls of the office. That's, you can't buy that. That's passion. And lastly, you need people that have entrepreneurial spirit, right? So now you have passionate, creative, entrepreneurial people. And those are people that don't care about corporate America, uh, people that don't care about rules and regulations and what's right. Um, they care about getting things done. As a matter of fact, they don't live in a world of silos with titles where they argue with you about was my title X, Y, or Z. Now, don't get me wrong. I have domain experts. I hate generalists. Uh, jacks of all traits, the converse is masters of none. I like having people that are really good in their vertical environments. That said, you can't silo yourself in it. Entrepreneurialism is about understanding the light at the end of the tunnel and saying, hey, I understand that we all need to, as a team, get there. And if there's something that's falling through the crack and it happens to be not my job, I do it anyways. Right? Um, famous stories about CEOs cleaning toilets. Um, that's kind of the, the credo of entrepreneurialism. Now, I've built many teams in life. And you can say that there's a difference between building one-hit wonders and the Beatles. And I would call both of them, you can also create people that are not even the one-hit wonders. I would claim if you don't have creative, passionate, entrepreneurial people, you're in the good luck to you. You're not even getting to a one hit. Now, if you have creative, passionate, entrepreneurial people, there's still a massive chasm between going from one hit wonders to the Beatles, which is longevity, which requires one final secret trade that's not part of the DNA of humans. Um, and that one is really not learnable. And one that you need to be completely conscious of and intolerant of, which is, and I apologize for the term, but that's what I use with my team. I'm from the West Coast nowadays. No assholes on the team. <laughs> and that's really important. There are about four types of people in the world that you run into. Um, super smart people that are super nice. They're rare, but they exist. Well, those people are pretty straightforward. You want to grab as many of them, you want to throw gasoline on their little fires, put some fertilizer on them, and just keep giving them more scope and more responsibility and letting them do more creative, crazy things. Then there's the people that are completely useless, and I'll, I'll use a different term for you guys, prickly. Um, but you can insert the previous one in it. 
uh, people that aren't really doing anything productive and are prickly. Well, those are super easy. Um, you should have a good interview process, not hire them, but if you happen to make a mistake, it happens, you get rid of them super quickly. So that's in the easy side of life. Then there's the you know, harder type of people. And there's the people that are super nice, but you know, they're just not getting much out. Um, turns out that those are the people I spend the most time with um, to try to vector them from one side to the next because you know, they have their heart is in the right place and that's the only thing you can buy out of people. Um, the, la la the rest is learnable. And you spend a ton of time. Those are the people you spend the majority of your time mentoring. And then there's the hardest people, and I've run into a lot of these people in my life. And it's so addicting, because they save you every single time. Um, these are the people that every time you're in a bind, they like do something miraculous, and you're like, how could you possibly do that? Um, so they're the you know, evil geniuses. Um, those people poison the well. You become a one-hit wonder. They erode the entire creativity of the team and the entire collaborative spirit, where people start feeling you know, insecure about getting their ideas out, because they get you know, people that are tough on people. You know, Steve Jobs is probably the greatest example of the prickly smart genius. Um, I refuse to have Steve Jobs type mentality or people on my team. Um, and I think that's important in the world of tomorrow. Um, being rude to people, we should all be tough on product. I am very tough on product. My standards for what we ship are super high. I am never tough on people and I'm intolerant of people that are tough on people. Um, and that no prickly rule is how you get to the Beatles. Turns out that the whole world is still trying to chase connect. Nobody has been able to replicate it to date. That's so five years ago. That same team, and if I had to hire a brand new team, I wouldn't be in a HoloLens. I wouldn't be accelerating. I would not have gotten to Windows Hello and we would not have Cortana. I have about 85% of my original team still with me. And the other ones left in very good terms and you know, now run pieces of the world. Um, and working for Elon Musk on the things that he announced yesterday um, to any number of other things. Uh, so we're super happy for them. There's a small world um, with a small set of smart people that are pushing it forward. The more we can get the same culture across, the same new benefits and styles, which I think are the more modern way of shipping product, um, the world revolves in a better place. So to answer your question, four things. Creative, passionate, entrepreneurial people that are non-assholes. <laughs> Well, let's give Alex, oh, there's one right here. I'm sorry. Please go ahead. Hi. Hi. Um, my name is Zachary Engelmeyer. I'm a first year mechanical engineering student. Um, really interested in, uh, and passionate about entrepreneurialism and, uh, and the, the creation of holistic, sustainable uh, communities in our urban environments. Um, and I have sort of an image um, of, of what we can uh, using technologies that we have today and that are being developed of, of how we could render those sort of holistic communities. Um, but as, as I have all of these items bombarding my, my brain and, 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 and you know, these different ideas I've written down, um, I'm, I'm at a stage where I want to start attacking them and, and, and uh, you know, uh, turn, these, turn these ideas into, um, with the help of uh, hundreds of people around the world who have similar interests. Um, do that uh, in, in the reality, um, but uh, I, I uh, so I want a little bit of advice on how to process um, the, the different ideas so that you can sort of go from point A today to somewhere near point B in, in the future. Thank you. It's a great question. The answer is very carefully. Um, at the end of the day, I'll suggest a few things. It goes back to um, visions are easy. It's easy to dream the world of tomorrow. Execution is the hard part. Execution requires discipline and it requires focus. Um, that's probably one of the chiefest things I learned coming to college. Discipline and focus. Um, and the ability to you know, take ideas and transition them into um, fact. Now, in that world, I'll give you some tools that at least work for me, and maybe now I'm showing my age. Uh, but I have a notebook, um, a paper one. Uh, moleskin, turns out. Um, and uh, I've annotated on this moleskin, um, same moleskin, by the way. Um, I'm quite dense on, on my, on my um, annotations for the last um, seven or so years. 
Um, and it's important because these things ruminate in your mind, um, but you have to keep asking yourselves, you know, how again, how do you go step by step? How do you create, how do you go from an idea to a roadmap? And then what is going to be the deliberate set of actions you're going to do to experiment, right? And don't go too long before you come out of the flip side because, again, infinite probabilities at any point in time measure one, destroy all others. Trying to predict the future is futile, right? So from that perspective, you want to build in the learning cycle, right? I could have taken a stab of let's do the entire table and I won't come out of my lab until the table's done and I'm long and gray and the table's irrelevant. Then I wasted my life. Taking smaller pieced projects that are crew to the end result are super important because what they provide you is with a learning ability, right? It's not about doing easy before hard. It's about building the learning cycle, which is a polite way of saying failing and failing a lot, right? Uh, failing is the single most important thing in life. If you're not failing, you're not trying hard enough, right? You don't know how high you can go. So from that perspective, you want to go learn. And as you learn, you find that you change your point of view. Remember, it's all clean for me to sit here seven years and tell you this beautiful little story of the table. It didn't start there. Go see the notebook seven years ago. And those, those thoughts reasoned over time as you learn, and you learn through failure, and you learn through a lot of failure. And through that failure, you build the building blocks um, for where to go from there, new points of view, new ways of thinking about the problem, new ways of experimenting, um, new you know, essentially triage down a whole segment of probabilities, um, but you find that in the world of infinity, there's still plenty to choose from, but you want to be in a very constant world of pruning, and pruning matters, and being, again, disciplined and focused on saying, okay, I have an idea, well, write it down, how would you implement it? If that's too complicated, what's the easiest thing that you can comprehend, and how would you implement that? And then go do it, go learn from it, go put it out there. Right, and then in the process of learning, keep doing it. Keep growing the surface area of your expertise and the surface area of, you know, um, don't get complacent. You'll start succeeding. The worst thing that you can do is then stop. Never be afraid to then continue failing. Fail every single day. Thank you. Hey. Time for one more question? Uh, just quickly. Um, could you describe how you see the haptic feedback developing, the, the third box, in the course, maybe not the fine, maybe the fine is too far out? I'm sorry, I didn't hear your question, even though your microphone was actually working. I heard something about haptic feedback. Well, so the feedback part of your matrix, uh -huh. how do you see it evolving? Maybe in the course, not the fine. You mean the haptic feedback one? Yeah. Um, well, I don't know, I'm not there yet, but uh, I'll point you to some interesting research. Um, I would say probably Tokyo University is the you know, leading organization in the world at thinking through some of that space right now. Um, they do it primarily based on acoustics. Um, they put really positioned acoustics on every cell of your body and they give you the impression of feeling. Now they do it in a very small area right now, something about this big that costs hundreds of thousands of dollars. And you put your hand in it though and you feel you know, holographic rain or you know, little holographic elephants running by. You can see a world where that would work, but you know, then I think about, you know, again, the world. Um, it was pretty easy for you to put some you know, um, dots on a human and understand human movement. It was also pretty easy to chin strap you in and make you see a hologram. To make it work across the entire world, inside and outside, across the you know, population of Earth, it becomes more complicated. Right? So I don't know how it would outfit most likely environments at that point, not people, um, with enough acoustic points that you could walk into it um, and feel energy on every single piece of your body. But I'm totally speculating and making it up right now. I have no idea. One of the points about um, discipline and focus is not to think about things that aren't now. Right? I am very disciplined and focused. The only thing I eat, breathe, and sleep right now is holograms uh, and the human input stuff that I still own. Right? Um, but um, there's enough there for you to keep munching at the problem. And you know, a key thing, again, is like be in the now. I'm not in the now for haptics. I spend zero of my time thinking about it. I read the internets like the rest of us. Cool stuff comes out. People send it to me. Um, I read it. That's how I found the Tokyo University little elephant thing. Um, but um, as soon as I feel like we have a good enough gauge and success and it's on rails, this idea of human input and output and environment understanding, you know, we'll have to think about objects and haptic feedback. Objects is a much harder problem as well that I have no idea about. 
Um, today, you know, I can place something on top of an object, but it's just a mash. Um, the idea of me being able to, in real time, recognize that as a coffee cup from a certain maker with any number of things, that search space is ginormous. Um, and if you want to think about doing that in the submarine underwater with no internet connectivity, that becomes massively even more complicated. Right? And again, I don't know how we're going to solve that problem. I'm not really thinking about it. But I did mean what I said. As you start shifting right and shifting down, you gain an order of magnitude of complexity, which is why I don't think about it. Because then you say, hey, the learnings from the one order of magnitude less is what's going to inspire the, the, the work we're going to do ahead. I had no idea about how to do holograms before we could figure out how to even understand a human. But in the process of doing that, we learned a lot. Things became a lot less scary. Um, and, and so on and so forth. So I don't know. I wish I could tell you. If I did, I'd be implementing it. Um, but I don't know. It's a great question. If you have any bright ideas, I'm hiring. Hi. Um, I'm a game design student. I'm a storyteller in the game design um, student uh, thesis building. And I had a question. Um, how were you, if you were afraid, and how did you get over it, to prove to someone, a company, to Microsoft, that you were worth taking the risk to build what you wanted to build with the Kinect? That's a great question. Um, and the answer is, you can't care. I tell people, a lot of people you know, that invite me to go talk um, in VC firms or startups or startup accelerators, I tell everybody, the first purchase you should make is go buy a Teflon suit. Um, and wear it and wear it proudly because, you know, if you were to be caring about what people are going to say to you, this is going to be a really uh, mean world to you. You can't care, right? And at the end of the day, you know, I, we just had a very successful day um, this Wednesday by every stretch of the imagination. And people came to me afterwards and they said, are you excited? Um, let's go celebrate. And I was about as muted as I am now, which, by the way, is about as muted as I am um, when, you know, whoever um, tells me no, which is this idea that at the end of the day, look, if you're going to work in a high variance world and if you're trying to pitch an idea or if you're trying to fail or if you're trying to actually push the envelope of what's possible, agree ahead of time that it's a high and understand and acknowledge and get ready for it. It's a high variance world. And if you're in a high variance world, I'll tell you my mechanism is I don't celebrate the victories any more than I mourn the losses. And then as soon as you start not mourning the losses anymore, you start kind of not caring. And then there's a certain level of stubbornness that is required for a high variance life. Um, you need to acknowledge and again, be prepared for it. If you don't believe it in every soul of your body, um, then you know, it's not a really that great idea for you. It's a very painful world. Um, you have to care to a point that it doesn't matter. If people tell you no, you just go talk to the next person. They tell you, no, you go talk to the next person. Eventually, someone says yes. If nobody says yes, well, there's always mom and dad, um, right? Make, make the dream smaller and try going from there. Um, but it's all about, again, discipline and focusing and, and making it smaller. Um, and once you do get the yes, now that's the scary part. I will tell you that no's are easy. You get used to them. You get desensitized, and you just, if you're stubborn, they just give you more energy. Because you know what? By definition, um, vision, the term, um, means it's something that nobody else sees. Otherwise, we call it common sense. We wouldn't call it vision. Now, if nobody can see something that you can't see, you can't expect them to understand it. You can't expect them to be accepting of it. If they did, almost that's the metric. The first time you present something to someone, they say, that's a great idea. Man, you didn't try hard enough. Go back to the drawing board. Try something else. <laughs> right? Um, it's not visionary enough. Uh, now, so if you expect that it is going to be visionary, then you should expect the majority of the time people are going to tell you no. They're going to call you crazy. They're going to call you names. They're going to shout at you. Remember, lots of prickly people in the world, particularly in Silicon Valley, because um, that generation is still all there. Um, it's tough. I won't tell you it's easy. Um, however, I'll tell you the tougher one and the one that scares me every single day is when they say yes. Because when they say yes, all of a sudden you have the responsibility to deliver. Um, and I'll tell you what that feels like. It's like going up on a hill um, and jumping off a cliff without a parachute and falling at terminal velocity as you're building the parachute. <laughs> now, here's news for you. You have no idea you can build a parachute. But you're like, damn it, I'll either die or I'll die trying. I should try really hard because, you know, Earth is approaching me at terminal velocity. Um, 
I hope I will break some bones, but at the end of the day, the, the travel is going to be delicious. And that's why you do it, but you know, that is the scary moment. When you're on top of the mountain, you're just telling other people, trying to convince them to jump off the cliff. <laughs> Once they say yes, you just, by definition, jumped. Now, if you're a single person, you know, that's some amount of freaking yourself out. If you're responsible for several thousand people um, and their lives and their livelihoods and their careers, the responsibility and the fear and the palpitation is much harder. I um, mean, you still have no idea. It's not like I sit here today telling you, oh yeah, stuff is easy. I don't know what I'm doing every single day. I come to work and I'm like, what the hell am I doing? What have I gotten myself into? Um, and you know, that's what motivates me, to be quite honest with you. Um, why? Because I'm stubborn. And I believe in this thing more than I believe in anything else in my life. Alex, on behalf of RIT, before my throat completely dies, I want to thank you for this question and answer period because I think the audience really got an exposure and, and penetrated into your mind a little bit. And for our students here, that's priceless. I'll just tell you that right now. Let's give Alex Kipman our 2015 Innovator of the, sorry, Innovation Hall of Fame inductee a very warm round of applause. And that concludes our uh, event here. I uh, appreciate you all for coming. I want to remind you, of course, tomorrow is a very big day for RIT. It is our Imagine RIT. It starts all over the campus at 10 o'clock. We hope to see you there. If you're interested in learning more about our, our inductees to the Innovation Hall of Fame, please visit our website. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Our Christine Corrado and Janet Frank who in fact are from Alumni Affairs and quite, to be honest with you, they did almost all the work. They brought all the information in, they sent all the emails and they need to be recognized. But um, now to introduce the, uh, the film that we're gonna show the short and, uh, and to talk a little bit about our inductee, we're gonna have uh, our provost, um, we're gonna have our provost um, come in and give the talk. Thank you, Richard. A couple of weeks ago, my wife and I found uh, ourselves in uh, that American curious innovation called the shopping mall. And we left a store, and I noticed that there was a young girl in kind of the courtyard of the mall there gyrating and dancing in front of a sofa where there were some adults, and presumably they were her parents. And as we walked past the, the group there, I noticed that the adults weren't really looking at the young girl dancing and gyrating. They were looking at the video screen there where there was an avatar beautifully syncopated to the girl's movements. Well, of course, it was an Xbox One and the Kinect system was working perfectly. And I turned to my wife and I said, <clears throat> that's RIT right there. Well, if you think about how many Xbox Ones and Xbox 360s with the- To replicate the great universities of the 20th century, but because we're so different, and in many cases already practicing what other universities are moving to provide in the future. Our focus on STEM, integrated with the arts, fine arts, design, business, social sciences, and the humanities is fundamental to the innovative engine that we've become here. But in the end, it's always our students who take our IT to innovative heights, and some of those heights we administrators can only imagine. Alex was this type of student, and our clear choice for the RIT Innovation Hall of Fame. And to help you understand the process by which he was chosen for this award, I want to introduce Richard DiBartino, our Simone Endowed Chair Holder for Innovation and Entrepreneurship at RIT, and the director of the Simone Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship, who will explain the process. Richard?
Thank you and welcome everyone. Let me briefly explain the process of inducting individuals into the Innovation Hall of Fame and then recognize individuals that sat on the committee and the, the people that did the real work. Um, first of all, when we actually in induct people into the Innovation Hall of Fame, it's a big process issue because we reach out to all 114,000 RIT alums and we send them email messages asking them to nominate and we make phone calls. So when you get mad at RIT for sending too many emails, well, we're one of the, the people that you should be blaming. But we also go to the faculty, we also go to employers, we go to the entire RIT community. And when we do this, we typically will get one or 200 names, some formal nominations, some non-formal nominations, but it's a lot of information. Um, those go to two committees. The first is a committee that weeds through them and, and generally comes up with a dozen or so. Sometimes it's two dozen, sometimes it's one, but we try to bring it down. And then there's a selection committee and they determine who goes in. So this year, again, we had over 100 that we reviewed. It went to the committee and as we went through it, and it went to the selection committee, they kept on talking about the individuals and the same name came up first and then many other names and there were great individuals that were considered, but um, Alex was the one that was so pronounced, we decided we're only gonna select one and this year we we're gonna bring Alex in and we were very pleased, the, the committee was very pleased with the selection. Let me go through some of the names um, that were involved in this. The nomination committee um, included Scott Atkins, Enid Cardinal, Robin Cass, Frank Cost, Dick Doolittle, um, Kelly Redder, Sandra Rothenberg, Andreas Sikalakis, and Becky Simmons, and all of those came from different academic fields and, and with different experiences so that we could give everyone their, their due. The selection committee included many former inductees into the Innovation Hall of Fame, and that included Andrew Brenneman, Barry Colhane, Jim DeCaro, Bob Fabio, Hector Flores, Emerson Fullwood, John Hamilton, Dean Kamen, Patricia Moore, Jackie Pankari, Ken Reed, John Rasig, Andrew Sears, and Brian Shanahan. And so um, the last group of individuals I'd like to recognize for their work. Welcome everyone. Before we begin, let me once again thank our interpreters who enrich our experience here through their extraordinary talent. You know, I've tried to learn a bit of sign language while I'm here, and I am constantly in awe of what these people do, uh, especially the fast processing that has to occur up here. Uh, you know, imagine RIT is one of RIT's biggest days. But the evening before, actually, we, we, we sort of settled on a tradition of celebrating innovation here and the innovative spirit that we're in the process of engendering here on our campus. And for five years, we have inducted a wide range of innovators with strong ties to RIT, and many of whom, like Chester Carlson and George Eastman, uh, had a relationship with RIT sort of earlier, maybe even back to the time of our inception. And history may show, however, that tonight's honoree, Alex Kipman, he may outshine them all. I just simply cannot imagine his, what his career will look like when, the, when he's done because he's still at very early stages of his career. Much like Alex, of course, RIT has innovation at our core, uh, maybe, maybe in some way because most of our top academic programs are actually in non-traditional disciplines. And the level of, cross, of collaboration across disciplines is, uh, is, is quite strong here. And our unique focus on the deaf and hard of hearing and that's internationally recognized, and I think adds a kind of diversity to our community that you just won't find anyplace else. And our innovative nature is just one of the things that puts RIT in the category of the world's great universities. Not so much because we seek to next system have been sold in the United States. And I did a little Google search, so it's totally unscientific. I estimate there's at, at least 35 million units have been sold. 35 million units. There are 111,000 households in the United States. Now, not all of those units sold went into an American household. But, but even if 15 million of those units were sold and went into American households, think about the impact 
that an RIT graduate has had with that single invention. It's absolutely astounding that the impact is there. And I think you can all appreciate why Alex was chosen for this year's Innovator of the Year Award from RIT. But <clears throat> the impact is felt not just in those numbers, by, but by the people he has influenced and people he has impacted. And there's no better way to capture that impact than in a, one of our wonderfully produced videos. So let's enjoy that video now. I'd like to present Mr. Galazano with something very special. This is our first sweatshirt bearing the name <laughs> of our brand new college. We created the software engineering program in the mid-90s, and Alex was in the first class of 15 brave souls who decided to switch.